Hello, welcome to Amazing Grace Online. Glad you're here. We are in the Gospel of Mark, and today is Lesson 1, the introduction to the Gospel of Mark. We were going to add on Mark chapter 1, verses 1 to 13, but I've decided to put that into another lesson. That will be Lesson 2. Today we are going to look at some introduction to the Gospel of Mark, and we're going to begin with uh, prayer. So let's ask the Lord to bless our time together. Father God, thank you for being with us today. And Lord, we thank you for your word that is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. And Father, we thank you for your story that is recorded within the pages of the Bible. We thank you that it is your word. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you would lead, guide, direct, and inspire our hearts as we look through your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, just a couple introduction uh, things we want to cover. First of all, I want to encourage you to, if you haven't done so, please download the study guide that goes with each study. You can find it at agstpaul.com and under this week's Bible study. So please uh, go there and download it. Um, I want to begin today by just uh, starting out with what are some tools for doing a, a Bible study from a book of the Bible. Well, I want to share with you some of my tools. Uh, one of them, this is one of my favorite ones. It's called uh, an in, it's 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 called a popular survey of the New Testament. I almost forgot which one I picked up here. Popular survey of the New Testament. This one is written by Norman Geisler, and this was one of the textbooks that I had back in school, and love. Old Testament survey, New Testament survey, and Norman Geisler has done a wonderful job uh, in taking each book uh, and taking it and kind of dissecting it, uh, the who, what, where, when, why approach, and also the themes uh, that are seen. Another one that I like to use is the Expositor's uh, Bible Commentary. And this is by Frank Gabelin, and this is a great tool. Uh, also uh, available, and you could probably find these two at Half Price Book if you're looking for a used one or if you'd like to pick up and not spend a whole lot of money uh, for your library. Another thing to get is a great study Bible. Um, this one is the HCSB uh, study Bible, and great uh, Bible full of maps and uh, information all in one. And so there we have it. So uh, that's just where we begin. And when we're doing a, a Bible study where we're looking at authorship and what, who's the audience and so forth, it's nice to have some of that background material. And how do you compose that? Well, you just sit down and go from there. Uh, another thing is when we do a Bible study on a, a book in the Bible, it's important to read through that book. And also outline it yourself. You know, look at the first chapter. What is the what is the chapter headings? You know, and the the verses, and write them down, and and try to form an outline. Uh, look at other people's outlines, and you know, like Norman Geisler's. I'm going to share with you Norman Geisler's outline for the Book of Mark uh, at the end of of this uh, study today. But uh, as we begin here today, I uh, want to look at several things. We're going to start out with who wrote. Uh, the book of Mark. And you've seen his name. Okay, well, you, you've gone, well, of course we've seen his name. His, his name is Mark, and that's on his book. Well, his real name is John Mark, and he pops up in the book of Acts. And this is kind of neat. We're going to see some names that we're familiar with, and it's all going to come back to this author uh, and so forth. So between the book of Acts, the book of Mark, and, and some other books. But uh, for today, let's uh, unfold this. So our authorship, if you want to write this in on your study guide, our first one is the author is John Mark. Two names. Okay. Now, we know something about John Mark because in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 12, verse 12, uh, this gives the name of his mother. His mom was named Mary. Uh, Mary was a common name uh, back in the time. And Mark's mom, John Mark's mom, is Mary. And that's in Acts chapter 12, verse 12. She had a large house in Jerusalem. And it is, this verse ascribes Mary as the mother of John Mark. But this house is also uh, the house that some speculate that the Last Supper took place in. And we read about the Last Supper in Mark chapter 14, verses 12 to 16 uh, in the Gospel of Mark. 
Also, uh, Mark may have been the young man who fled naked in Mark chapter 14, verses 51 to 52. He didn't say that it was himself. He just said a young man uh, was, was there and he was following and he went to run away. They grabbed his garment and fell off and he ran away. Now, here's the thing. Mark was not a disciple the, you know, of the 12 disciples. He wasn't one of the 12 disciples. He was a follower of Christ. And he was there in the garden of Gethsemane or near it while Jesus was arrested or being taken in and so forth uh, to, for the trials. Um, here's an interesting tidbit. Do you know whose uncle uh, is Mark's? It's Barnabas. He's the Levite from Cyprus. We read about him in Acts chapter 4, 36 to 37. Barnabas had the original name. His name was Joseph. And the disciples renamed him Barnabas. Barnabas means son of encouragement. And so he was a very encouraging man to be around. He's the one who brought uh, Saul, uh, who later became Paul, after his conversion to Jesus, after uh, Saul's conversion to Jesus, Barnabas reached out to him, brought him before the other disciples. And at first they're really leery about him because they were concerned that this guy was a murderer. He turned people over to to have them executed and so forth. And anyway, he was a, he was converted to Jesus. And it was Barnabas, the encourager, who introduced Paul then to the rest of the disciples. Well, John Mark also, he traveled with Paul and Barnabas. And the first missionary journeys, they started out on this first missionary journey in Acts chapter 13, verse 5, and then verse 13. We see that John Mark abandoned them. Uh, he must have gotten cold feet and he abandoned uh, this mission, this missionary uh, journey. Well, this caused some trouble between Paul and Barnabas. And we read about that in Acts chapter 15, verses 36 to 41. But later on, he became a co-laborer, a fellow laborer, as Paul called him. And we read about that in Philemon chapter 1, verse 24. Also Colossians 4, 10 and 11. John Mark also accompanied Peter. Uh, John Mark and Peter were pretty good friends. In fact, the early church fathers uh, said that John Mark was an interpreter for Peter. He would, you, he would interpret uh, for Peter when they would do some mission outreaches. Peter called him his son. That was in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13. We also see that Mark composed his gospel. This is an interesting thing because Mark hung around uh, with Peter. Mark composed his gospel from Peter's memoirs. And we're going to give you some internal evidence for that in a few moments. But uh, some of the early church fathers, Justin Martyr, 150 AD, uh, he, he claims this, that he had heard that uh, Mark's gospel was taken from Peter's memoirs. And also, uh, we'll look at uh, the sermons of Peter, especially one sermon, Acts chapter 10, verses 36 to 42. This outline uh, that, Peter, that Mark used was actually traced to Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 10, verses 36 to 42. I hope that makes sense. Well, I want to jump now to some internal evidence for the authorship uh, being John Mark. Uh, okay, so the author... Here's the first one. Number one, the author is familiar with the geographical features of the land of Israel and specifically Jerusalem. And Mark chapter 5, verse 1, Mark 6, 53, Mark 8, 10, 11, 1, and 13, 3 all give us a clue to this. Uh, when, if you're taking notes, you know, you don't have to write everything down specifically and you're maybe saying, well, why didn't you just have this for us on the paper? Well, friends, I find that if I write down something, I, rem I remember it better. So, happy writing. <laughs> anyway, uh, the second thing that we see for internal authorship is the author knew Aramaic uh, or Aramaic. This is the common language of the day and John Mark was familiar with that language. And we see this in Mark 5.41, Mark 7.11, and verse 34, and Mark 14.36. Number three, the author understood Jewish institutions and customs. And we see this from Mark chapter 121, 2.14, and verse 16 of chapter 2. 
verse 18 of chapter 2, and also Mark chapter 7, verses 2 to 4. Fourth, number four, the, there are, are vivid accounts of Jesus' inner circle. And Jesus, remember, Jesus' inner circle consisted of Peter, James, and John. Now, the only way Mark could have this information is by connection with Peter. Peter revealed what they all talked about, what happened in these inner, uh, the inner circle of, of Jesus. And, and Peter revealed this to Mark, and he wrote this down. Uh, we, references to the inner circle are numerous. Uh, Mark chapter 1, 16 through 20, 29 to 31, 35 to 38, and then Mark chapter 5, 21 to 24, uh, 35 to 43, Mark chapter 6, 39, 53 to 54 verses of Mark chapter 6. And then we jump to Mark 9, verses 14 to 15, Mark 10, 32, verse 46 of chapter 10. And finally, Mark chapter 14, 32 to 34. These are all references to the inner circle that, that Mark makes. And once again, I find that intriguing that Peter was there. Jesus would pull them aside and uh, only allow those three to be near for these various uh, ministry outreaches or um, occasions. Well, Mark heard about this from Peter and wrote it down. Number five. Mark used Peter's words and deeds. So Mark then heard Peter speak these words and Mark repeated them. And we read about this. Here, here it is on the screen. Mark chapter 8, 29 and verses 32 to 33. Mark 9, 5 through 6. Mark 10, 28 to 30. Mark 14, 29 to 31. And verses 66 to 72 of Mark 14. I want to give you these because if you want to look these up for yourself, you're sure welcome to. There are numerous uh, passages we're going through today just in this introduction. But if you'd like to go back and read some of these, I encourage you. It's really interesting how they're put together. Well, the author added and Peter in the resurrection account of Mark chapter 16, verse 7. And also see in 1 Corinthians 15, 5. Well, we see that uh, Mark added and Peter. And so Mark uh, spent a lot of time. As I said, Mark spent a lot of time with Peter, was used as his interpreter and so forth. So they had a good friendship. Well, number seven, the author provides a striking similarity between the broad outline, his broad outline in Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 10, verses 34 to 43. And so the whole book of, and I'm going to be more specific on this one. This pops up again uh, towards the end of our, our time together today. But Peter actually gives a message in Acts chapter 10, verses 34 to 43. And uh, Mark is taking notes. He's writing down and he's using that sermon as an outline for his book. I find that quite fascinating. Well, let's look at some external evidence. And these are terms that Norman Geisler uses in his popular survey of the New Testament, uh, specifically the Gospel of Mark. Internal uh, evidence and external. Jumping to external evidence, what does this mean? This means from outside the book of Mark. And so let's begin with this first one. Number one, early manuscripts have Mark's name on them. Uh, early church father, uh, Papias, AD 110, attributed authorship to John Mark. Number two, other early church fathers all agreed that John Mark was the author. And just a list of these church fathers, Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria, Justin Martyr, uh, Titian, Tertullian, Origen, Jerome, and Eusebius. Eusebius. These church fathers, these early church fathers, um, all agreed that John Mark was the author. The date written, it's, it's varied um, among commentators or scholars. Um, I chose a date uh, that uh, Norman Geisler had chosen uh, between 57 and 59 AD. Some go clear up to 64 AD, uh, but it was well before uh, Jerusalem burned or was ransacked in 70 AD. Uh, we have no mention of that happening. And so the, the events of that day. And uh, Jewish historian Josephus, he talks about the time of, of 
the gospels of their of their writing and so forth and he notes the things that happened in the secular world and so forth well mark doesn't make any mention of of that happening along with the other writers of the gospel the recipients uh, of mark's writing were christians in rome and he he had a purpose for writing this in fact he uses some terminology he uses some specific uh, greek words and latin words uh, that would be meaningful for the Romans. And one of those words is evangelion, which is good news. And some of this, and we'll go into this in our next lesson, our first uh, installment of, of uh, the lesson looking into the scriptures. And we're, we're gonna be covering in our next lesson, Mark chapter one, verses one to 13. And Mark begins that gospel with uh, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And he puts good news. And he is the one that really put the word gospel uh, into circulation. And it's an old Roman term, and it was associated with the emperor's birthday, the good news of his birthday and so forth. And there was a reward associated with a carrier of good news. Well, uh, later on, gospel or good news came to stand upon its own as good news. So that's where we see it. Now, the reason for Mark's writing, uh, first of all, he wants to depict Christ as a servant. And that is the theme throughout Mark, is that Jesus Christ is the servant. He's the servant of God. He's the son of God and the son of man, and he's serving God and he's serving man. And so we'll see that unfold in, as we look at the Gospel of Mark. The second reason that he wrote the Gospel of Mark was to provide a historical explanation of the Gospel. Okay, good news. Number three, Mark also wanted to provide a defense of the Messiah, Jesus, in light of Jewish rejection of him as their Messiah. And we see this in Mark chapter 3, verse 5, where he specifically says that the, the Jewish audience, they were hostile to receiving Christ as their Messiah. We see that in Mark chapter 3, verse 5, and then also in Mark 7, verse 6. The theme, once again, I think we mentioned the theme, Jesus Christ, the servant of the Lord. That is our theme. And our key verse is this, Mark chapter 10, verse 45, where Jesus says, For the Son of Man has not come to be served, but has, has come to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. The uniqueness of Mark. Here, let's jump over to some unique features of the Gospel of Mark. The first thing is, Mark is the shortest of the Gospels. Some would, someone said that Mark can be read in 1.5 hours. And I think they said that it can be read aloud in 1.5 hours. So you can sit down and read all 16 chapters in the book of Mark in about one hour, hour and a half or so. Well, to compare this, let's look at Luke with the amount of verses. Luke has 1,151 verses. That is the longest gospel. And remember that Luke, uh, was he was not a disciple of, of Jesus uh, like Matthew and, and uh, John and Peter. Uh, Luke was a physician and he wrote the book of Acts and he also wrote the Gospel of Luke. But he interviewed many, many people to compile uh, his work, uh, the, the Gospel according to Luke. His Gospel uh, encompasses 1151 verses. Second to Luke is the Gospel of Matthew, and that has 1,071 verses. Next, we have John, and John has 879 verses. Now, compare that with Mark. Mark has 661 verses. So his Gospel is very short. Now, one thing that we're going to notice when we go through the, the Gospel of Mark is this one, that Mark's Gospel is very fast-paced. Uh, he uses the word immediately over 40 times. And he just goes from one event to the other. It's like a rapid succession of all these happenings uh, that Jesus uh, did. And it, it, the camera moves quickly. It's a fast-paced gospel. Okay. Another thing, Mark wrote with very vivid distinctness. And this is because Peter was there. Peter was the camera on on the on the uh, events that were witnessed and that he later told Mark about, and so we have some very vivid descriptions 
of, uh, of what happened in the Gospel of Mark. Well, as mentioned earlier, there's a basic outline of Mark, and this is patterned after Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 10, verses 36 to 42. So Peter's sermon provides the groundwork for the book of Mark. I find that interesting, and I know we repeated it, but things that are important are worth repeating. Number four, Mark, like John, doesn't include Jesus' birth, the genealogy of Jesus, or the early years. He picks it up with uh, John the Baptist entering the scene. And this happens immediately in the Gospel of Mark. Within the first few verses, we are introduced to John, John the Baptist. And we're going to see how uh, Mark also quotes Old Testament passages and so forth. We'll look at that in some greater detail next lesson. But Mark and John are very similar in the the fact that they don't include the early years of Jesus. Pre, uh, thir- uh, let's see, Jesus was 30 years old when he began his ministry, so he's not in, you know, we don't see when his child, what happened in his childhood, uh, like 12 years old and so forth. Uh, he begins with uh, John the Baptist coming on scene. Mark and John also are very similar in their beginning verses of their gospel. Uh, for instance, they use the word arche. And then that's the Greek word for beginning. And Mark is very deliberate in using the word beginning. He says the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Well, John also uses that word in NRK and Halagas. In the beginning was the word. And so Jesus is the focus of, of the gospels here. But we have a very deliberate use of the word beginning and it's it's meant to take us back to genesis uh, back to the great beginning of uh, creation and what mark is doing here is he's saying this is the new beginning of the gospel the good news of jesus christ that is being revealed it's a powerful word and mark is using it here to draw that parallel but as a new beginning of a of the gospel message the good news of jesus uh, jesus coming well let's i want to share an outline with you and this outline is provided by uh, norman geisler a popular survey of the new testament and I think you will find that on page 71. And so here's what we have. We have number one, uh, this is part one. Uh, Norman Geisler breaks this up into three parts. And I like how he does this. Here, it's like a sermon outline. Uh, the first one, number one, the service of the servant. This takes place in uh, Mark chapter 1, 1 through Mark 8, 26. This is the service. And under service, we have A, we have the ministry. And chapters 1 and 2, this is really the beginning of the Galilean ministry where uh, Jesus is now uh, getting uh, verified as the Son of God. And we're going to look at the four witnesses in chapter 1. That's next week. I keep telling you that, but come back and watch that. But his ministry, uh, we're going to begin there, chapters 1 and 2. His message, this would be B, his message this covers Mark chapter 3, verse 1 to Mark chapter 6, 29. And then we're going to look at his miracles. This covers Mark chapter 6, 30 through 8, 26. And this would be C, his miracles. 6, 30 to 8, 26. The second part of the outline, number 2, Roman numeral 2. Uh, Norman Geisler uses Roman numerals here. This is the sacrifice of the serv- servant. Uh, so this covers... Mark chapter 8, 27 to Mark chapter 15, 47. And so we begin with A, we are the foretold coming passion, where Jesus talks about uh, what is ahead. And this, is, this covers Mark chapter 8, 27 to Mark chapter 13, 37. And then B, we have a, a focused crisis present. And this is Mark chapter 14. Okay, uh, so foretold, focused, and finally, C, fulfilled. And what this is, culmination pressed. And Mark chapter 15. And we'll explain this as we go through uh, this, these, uh, these terms and so forth when we get there. Uh, the third part of Mark's gospel is the sovereignty of the servant. And this is the culmination of Mark's writing, chapter 16. And A, in arising. This is the resurrection of Jesus, and this encompasses uh, verses 1 to 8 of Mark chapter 16. And then B, in appearing, 
the reappearances. Mark chapter 16, verses 9 to 14. And then Mark uh, records the ascending, uh, ascending reception. Uh, that's in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 to 20. And so there's a simple outline and, uh, you know, read through this. I would encourage you before we begin with chapter 1, verses 1 to 13, just go ahead and skim the chapter chapters or read them and take notes. Get yourself some commentaries and, and uh, do some, some prep work uh, as, before we go through this as, as a group together our, on our online study. Well, uh, that's all I have for you today in our introduction uh, portion of the Gospel of Mark. And uh, look, check back each week on Wednesdays. We will make the lesson available. Uh, read ahead. Uh, read chapter 1, verses 1 to 13. And uh, just get familiar with the, the terms and so forth. And we'll give you some key words and so forth. But uh, one, you know this, that one of the key words is immediately. And that's seen over 40 times in the Gospel of Mark. Well, thanks for joining us today. And let's close in prayer and uh, go from there. Father, thank you for being with us and we thank you for our time together. And Lord, we, we are excited about your word. We thank you for the, the gospel of Mark along with the, the word of God that is there that Mark encompasses. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you would open our eyes and our hearts to see more of this mighty Savior that we serve. His name is Jesus. And thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, friend, may you have a great rest of the day and a great week. We'll see you next time.